Hey guys, it's John checking in from Dallas once again. And I had a pretty entertaining day. I played rounds four and five today. And I want to show you my first game I played this morning against Grandmaster Nadezhda Kosintseva. She's a Russian Grandmaster, rating of 2472, I believe. And she's been as high as 2576 FIDE. So she's quite the opponent. And I believe she got married in the past few years, uh, is now living in the U.S. and studying at my alma mater, UT Dallas. So this was a very long game. It was 72 moves, so I won't show the entire thing. I do want to pick it up at a critical moment, though, and this is the position you see right here. So this is black to move, and you'll notice that um, black is up the exchange, meaning black is up a rook for minor piece, and unfortunately I was playing white here. So as usual, you're seeing it from my perspective, and Grandmaster Kosintseva was black. And here she decided to play, instead of trading the queens on e3, she played queen a1 check. And I moved my king to g2, and then she took the pawn on a3. Okay, so I kind of keyed into this moment because the game is very long, and I don't quite have time to look through the entire thing. Uh, but this was a crucial moment in this encounter. So this is white to move. And if you'd like to pause your video and try to figure out the best strategy for white, the best line, you can do so now. All right, so I knew my situation was dire because I was down in exchange just a moment ago and I've also just lost a pawn. However, I had seen that I had something here and I kicked that off with queen e7. So invading with the queen on the seventh rank, this attacks the rook on d8 and also, my queen can kind of go a lot of different ways from here. I'm also hitting the pawn on c5, I'm attacking a7, maybe I can make some gestures towards black's king. So, in reply, Kosintseva played queen a5, holding the rook on d8. And now it's crucial that white find the next move, because without the next move, I'm in big trouble. And fortunately, I had seen that I could play bishop to d3 here. And if you saw this line, queen e7 followed by bishop d3, uh, good job to you, congrats, because this is the only way for white to try to save this position. So what are we doing with bishop d3? It looks like a silly move because we're taking the bishop off of a defendant square. It was nice and comfy on c4 where it supported the pawns. Uh, but on d3, we're, we're looking for bigger fish here. We're trying to create a battery with queen to e4. This would set up checkmate on h7. And even though the bishop is under attack by the rook, if black were to take... There's queen e8 check, king h7, and then queen e4 check. And white will gain a perpetual. White doesn't even have to take the rook after, say, king g8. Uh, they can just keep checking. And even if black were to block with the pawn here, pawn g6, white could check. King goes back, check again, and black will never be able to escape from this barrage of checks. So bishop d3 was a nice little tactical shot to set up my counterplay uh, without which I am hopelessly lost here. It's not a position that white can hope to hold. Uh, even though everything looks okay for now, being down the exchange for no compensation is not going to get the job done here. So, bishop d3. Now, I know a lot of players would have just taken the draw here as black because the threat of queen e4 and also the fact that the bishop cannot be captured without allowing a perpetual, it's a pretty strong argument in favor of the game just ending peacefully. However, I give great credit to my opponent because she uh, displayed a tenacious will to win in this one. So she played queen b6 here, just including her queen in the defense along the 6th rank. Um, now she is threatening to take the bishop because there might be an interposition of the queen on g6. So I have to continue as planned, queen e4. And now that I've set this up, once again it looks like black should do something about that, like taking the bishop and agreeing to the draw, essentially. Although this time I would have to take back, because note that if queen check, king h7, queen e4, there is that interposition of the queen I just mentioned. Uh, but after queen takes d3 instead, this would be an even queen end game. The weakness of the white pawns doesn't matter too much. There's not a whole lot else black can play for. So that would be a logical, a logical conclusion of the game. Uh, however, after queen e4, my opponent made the very bold decision to run out with her king. So she played king to g8, allowing checks on h7 and possibly on c4 as well, which is what I ultimately did. 
I thought about queen h7, but after king f7, uh, I think these checks could be coming to an end. Notice that g6 is not accessible because the queen does cover that square still. So checking on c4, on the other hand, restricts black's options. I thought she would just go back here, king h8, after which I was ready to play bishop d3 and repeat. Uh, however, once again, she chooses the, the risky attempt at a win. So she plays king f8 into the center. And I should mention that at this point, we're both in time pressure. We're both well under five minutes, and we're pretty much playing off the increment, as they would call it. So there's an increment in these games where you get 30 seconds added after each move. And often when you burn so much of your time in a game, you'll just be playing off those 30 seconds pretty much. Like you'll, you'll time down to like, you know, a minute or less. You'll make a move and you gain 30 seconds. And the point of that is like you're never truly in uh, terrible time pressure where pieces are just flying all over the place. There's always that 30 second buffer. And players use that to the maximum. I certainly did in this game. She had a little bit more time than me, but not, not by very much. So king f8, walking into the center and trying to escape this perpetual check net that I'm attempting to set up. So I played queen f5 check. And one nice aspect of this move is that if black blocks with the queen, notice that black has to operate uh, the dark squares here because the light squares are kind of off limits to them, uh, thanks to my strong light square presence with the bishop and the queen. But if queen f6, I can take this pawn with check and possibly even take a7, or just keep checking the black king. Like, say, queen e7, I might just go back and check again. One line I saw is that if black continues stubbornly trying to escape the checks, they might just end up getting checkmated. Like, that is a nice variation, supported by the pawn. So, in that position after queen f5, she, once again, has to come out with a king. So she plays king e7. King e8 would be queen f7 checkmate, a game ender right there. So... King e7, on the other hand, uh, is uh, playing around with the idea of trying to bring the king over to the queen side and try to hide it from the checks. So here I went queen f7 check, king to d6. And I kind of realized at this point that if I kept checking her, that would actually just push her in the direction that she wants to go with her king. So now I played a move that I think psychologically is pretty unpleasant for black, and that's just queen takes g7. I just took the pawn. So gaining a little bit of my material back. So now I have a pawn plus a minor piece for the rook that I've been down uh, for a while. And in doing this, I keep the black king in the center, in the danger zone where it's subject to many different checks. And I'm also taking a look at the h6 pawn. And guess what? I win that pawn next. So black played rook d7, and I took on h6 with check. And now right about here, I started thinking like, wow, it's actually possible I could even win this game despite having a position where I would happily have agreed to draw uh, at any moment. So queen takes h6, and I've got two passed pawns on the king side, where black doesn't have a lot of presence right now. So black played king c7. I went queen f4 check. I could try to trade queens, but I didn't want to trade them right away. I wanted to try to keep some tension on the board and just see if I could use my uh, queen activity, maybe to create some more threats against black's king. So queen f4 check, black played queen d6. And also like where the queen trade takes place is uh, a point of interest for both sides because here I played a move that uh, I think is kind of clever. It's trying to trade queens on uh, my own conditions. And if you'd like to pause your video and try to find that move, you can do so now. So white to move and how can white attempt to trade queens on their own terms? All right, well, given that I told you it was a queen trade option, there's probably not too many uh, moves you'd consider. And it's the move queen g3 is what I played. So a retreat move. But the point is, if black takes, I want to be able to take with one of my pawns and get two connected pawns versus these disconnected pawns right here. I'm not actually sure which way I would have taken. It would probably make most sense to take this way because you get connected pawns that are furthest away from the black king and rook. Although this provides a little bit more protection for the king. For instance, black can't check me on d2 now if I were to take that way. Um, but she's a very savvy player, and she saw what I was up to with queen g3 and did not take on g3. So instead, she played rook h7. And again, I didn't want to initiate the trade. Black is in a pin right here. Their queen is pinned to their king. 
Uh, but I can take this opportunity to get my pawns rolling, which is what I did. So I played h4, advancing. And here, black played rook h6. And finally, I decided, okay, now's the time to trade the queens. I can't really advance my pawns any further. h5 would just lose the pawn. I could check on g7, but I didn't like the fact that black could play king b6, and the king is relatively safe on this square. And my own king might be in danger, too, if I run out of checks against black's king. Like, now there's the threat of rook g6 check forking the king and the queen. So that's something I have to keep in mind. So I figured, like, okay, uh, the fun is over. Let's just get the queens off the board. I gained two pawns in this entire process where black tried to run their king out. Maybe I can even try to win. So I took on d6. She took with the king. She's going to want the king to come over to the king side in a bid to stop these pawns. And here I played king g3. She played king e5, just getting a little closer. It's tempting to check on f4 with the pawn right now, but I didn't like the fact that after king e4, black has very good king position, and she also might check me on g6 and try to force my king away from defending the pawn. So I wasn't in like a great hurry to give that check on f4. So here I played king g4, and now black played rook g6 check. I played king f3. She played rook f6 check. I played king g3. So black could just force a draw with rook g6, and it would probably just be back and forth. Uh, it'd be risky for white in the present position to try to play for a win. I kind of knew that, like, in the back of my head. The fact that these pawns are disconnected really hampers my winning chances. Although, if black makes a couple mistakes, these pawns could become a force. So instead of rook g6 check, she improved her king once more. She played king e4 getting a little bit closer. And I didn't want to allow a check on f3, so my next move was designed to prevent that. So I played bishop to e2, just covering that square. She gave a check on g6, and then I played bishop g4. So in game, when you're both playing on increments and you're kind of just playing um, uh, the moves a tempo, you know, just boom, boom, one after the other, it's hard to know like what's going to happen in a position like this because it's double-edged. Like I think any result is possible. White could win, black could win, or it could be a draw. It's, it's very hard to predict. And to her credit, once again, she, she pushed for the full point. She wasn't happy with the draw, and she really wanted to win this. So she played king d4, introducing the plan of going after the queenside pawns. Now that my bishop has abandoned that c4 point, she figures that maybe she can go over and take them. But that's a double-edged sword, right? Because now the king might be too far away to assist in defending against the pawns. The rook is trying to defend against the f and h pawns plus the bishop. And I have my king participating too. Um, I can tell you pretty much I would never do this if I were white. <laughs> like this whole plan, starting with her bringing the king out, scares me so much. Like unless I really, really, really had to win, I probably would just not risk this like ever. Um, maybe if I had to win to win the tournament or get a Grandmaster Norm or something. But um, yeah, she, she had a lot of faith in her abilities. So here I played King F4. Again, I wasn't sure exactly what the best move was. Several moves come to mind. H5 suggests itself just attacking the Rook. Um, F4 maybe getting the other pawn going, perhaps. But I wanted to make sure that Black's King actually could not come back into the action via E5, just in case Black were to change their mind and try to get the king over to assist in defending against the pawns. So I'm basically saying, like, go ahead, go over and take these pawns. I'm going to try to win by pushing faster than you can. So after king f4, she gave a check here. And now, originally I was intending to play bishop f5, but with the limited amount of time I had left, I saw an interesting plan whereby I can try to sacrifice this pawn to, like, jumpstart the h-pawn. And that's what I did. So instead of playing bishop f5 and blocking, I played king g5. And she took the pawn on f2. But now this h-pawn is off to the races. So h6, or h5 rather. And here she played king c3, so coming in and attacking the pawn. It wasn't too late to go king e5 if black really wanted. They're not in a great position to stop the pawn, but I thought there was a chance they, they might try to double back. Although you can see the king is kind of restricted, like it can't come to e6 or anywhere here. My bishop does a great job of defending against that. But she kept pushing forward, so king c3. I played uh, that h6 move, as I was saying, and here rook f8 was played. So this pawn is going to become uh, a big problem for black. It already is. 
Like, for instance, if black were to take on b3, how do you think the game would go? And if you'd like to solve that question yourself, you can pause your video and do so. So white to move. Okay, so if black were to take this, I saw that I could play h7, threatening to queen. Here black has to play either rook h2 or rook f8 to stop it. If rook h2, I have bishop h5, a nice interference move. So blocking the rook from defending against the pawn's advance. And after rook g2 check, I can play king here. And every, everything falls nicely into place for white. Rook g8 is impossible because we would just take it. So this pawn is going to queen. And that would be a huge reversal. Black loses here. So that's one nice line. Uh, there's also the line in the case of that king takes b3 move, uh, h7, rook f8. And this one has a nice point to it that works in white's favor as well. So I can go bishop e6 check. So throw in this check, force black to get out of the check, like let's say c4, and now bishop g8. And it's just awesome how the bishop cooperates with the h-pawn to help it to promote. So here I'm blocking the rook physically from defending h8, and once again, the pawn is going to promote. Black doesn't have any good checks or any other recourse. So that was a cool line to have found during the game, and that's when I really started to think I might win. Like, I was, I was pretty optimistic at this point. I thought, well, maybe Black's just blowing this entirely. But she kept her, uh, her cool here. She didn't take the pawn on b3. She instead played the rook back here, so just right away. I played bishop e6. So trying to guard the g8 square, but also defending b3. And now black played um, an excellent move that I didn't really anticipate. This is a resource that essentially saved the game for black. I was thinking, well, black's just done for because I can even stick my bishop on c4, and then uh, my h-pawn plus king will be good enough to win. However, black played king here, so king to b4, suddenly attacking the b5 pawn. And it's true I can play bishop c4, which is the move I actually played in the game. But say I were to play h7 instead, just threatening bishop g8, then black would have to go here. And if I play king here, they're just going to take this pawn. And I will win the rook, like this. But all white has to do here, or I'm sorry, all black has to do here in order to make the draw is just play a5, a4, and then trade for my remaining pawn. And game over, dead draw and I can't really do anything about that. So that was a little disheartening to realize that I could actually win the rook, but still not be able to win because I just don't have enough pawns left on the board after black eliminates this b5 pawn and then eventually gets b3. So instead I played the better move, I think, in this position. So I played bishop c4, looking to try to hold the pawns versus just pushing h7 right away. But now black played rook f2. So switching the rook unexpectedly to the second rank. And the plan now, after h7, which is what I did, is to start administering checks. So she played rook g2. And, or sorry, she played rook h2, actually. She could play rook g2 as well. It doesn't, doesn't make a difference. So getting behind the pawn, I played king here. I have to use my king to defend the pawn. If I play, like, bishop g8 or bishop d3, one of these pawns is undefended. So... I play king g6 with the simple plan of just playing king g7 and then trying to promote. But it doesn't matter. Black can start checking. And here we moved around for a little bit. I played king f6. She came back to h2. I played king g7. She checked again. And there's just nowhere to hide from the checks unless I want to bring my king like way far away from the pawn, which might even end up losing for white if I do that. Uh, also, if I go to the corner... Uh, I realize that there's no good plan after this. My king is stuck. It's blocking the promotion square. If black just plays a waiting move like rook g1, I can't even improve the position at all. And in fact, I think I might lose this because I'm in zugzwang over here. I can't move my king or my pawn. Playing b6 would just lose the pawn, so I'd have to move the bishop, and then black can chop one of these pawns. And black might win. So I saw the writing on the wall right around here check, and I just played my king away from the corner. I played king f8. She played rook back to h2. King g7, rook g2 check. The draw is becoming more apparent by the move. King f6, rook h2, king g7. 
And here I offered a draw and she agreed. So th that was a fascinating struggle in a bishop versus rook end game. And I was particularly struck by her courage to try to play for a win. I think that's a great example of fighting spirit in chess. She wasn't satisfied with that draw in the initial position after I set up that queen bishop battery. She, she even went to the brink of defeat to try to prove a victory here. And like I said, I don't think I would have done that. Objectively, I don't know if that's a good decision. But uh, I looked at this with the engine a few hours ago, um, and the engine actually validated much of her play. The engine said that this way of playing for black, sending the king over to the queen side, was justified, and all the while white is fighting for the draw. But you do run the risk of messing up in time pressure and possibly even suffering a loss if you're black there. But on the other side of the coin, white could lose too. So this game ended in a draw, 72 moves. Again, sorry I didn't show you the initial moves. There's a lot of play leading up to that. And fairly interesting game. I just don't have the time to look over it all with you guys. And um, I'll, I'll be back again soon with another video. Uh, just a quick comment on how the tournament's going. So you're going to see my next round in a second. But um, it's, uh, it's a nice tournament to play. The conditions are good here. And we're playing two rounds a day, so that's pretty tiring. One thing that um, you have to keep in mind in nine-round tournaments is that you, you really have to pace yourself, and expending a lot of energy on one game can often catch up with you in the second round. So one thing I really made a point of after this game was to get a little bit of a rest. just went back to my ho hotel room and kind of crashed on the couch a little bit because this is a long game, and I wanted to be revved up for the next round. And I hope you guys enjoyed this game analysis, and I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.